Today we begin the third book of the Torah, Parsha Vayikra, called in English Leviticus. Some people consider it to be one of the least interesting parts of the Torah. It's very detailed about something that we don't do today, right, which is animal sacrifices. Um, and it seems to go on and on and on about the killing of animals. And there are issues raised, you know, when the third temple is built, will we bring them or not bring them? Is it primitive? Is it barbaric? Mm -hmm. What is it about? We weren't alone in bringing sacrifices. The idea of bringing sacrifices in the ancient world was very common. Mm -hmm. um, so this week at the... And, and by the way, you should know that when a boy first begins to learn uh, the Sefer Torah, the Chumash, mm -hmm. right? You would think he would begin with Bereshis, with Genesis. Mm -hmm. right? He doesn't. The first parsha he reads is Vayikra. It's the first thing he learns is the beginning of Vayikra. And then he goes back. Mm -hmm. you know? um, very often when people publish a Chumash of their own, mm -hmm. uh, they will, the first book they publish is Vayikra. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes it's followed by Bereshis, Genesis, or sometimes by, Mid Bid by Midbar. Mm -hmm. and goes forward, goes back around. <clears throat> so Vayikra is clearly um, far more important than we give it credit for. Mm -hmm. And these sacrifices uh, must have meaning for us today because the Torah is forever. Mm -hmm. So I want to look at that. There are so many things in Vayikra that you want to talk about that we don't have time for. So mm -hmm. I'm going to try and stick to um, Rav Hirsch's look at this, and then we'll go on to Pesach, which also revolves around sacrifice as well. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so, he wants to talk tonight about, really about two central sacrifices. One is the Chatas, and one is the Ola. Mm -hmm. Chatas is the sacrifice you bring for a sin. Mm -hmm. right. Now, just so you understand, um, if you create, if you committed the sin intentionally, mm -hmm. you don't bring a chatas, mm. right? So a chatas is being brought for something that every one of us, when we were children, said, except maybe Michael, <laughs> uh, which is, I didn't mean to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm so I didn't I, I wasn't that wasn't my intention. I just made a mistake, mm -hmm. as if to say. That's, you know, I plead innocent, right? Mm -hmm. It's like temporary insanity mm -hmm. kind of thing. <laughs> it's uh, <clears throat> the Torah doesn't actually accept a sacrifice for a sin you do intentionally. Mm -hmm. But clearly it says you got a significant problem because you have to bring a chatas, which can be a very big sacrifice, for an unintentional sin. Mm -hmm. right? We'll talk about it in more detail, so, right? 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 Mm -hmm. The second, uh, the second uh, Corbin that he talks about at length today mm -hmm. is the um, Corbin Ola, mm -hmm. which is the uh, ascension, the elevation offering. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, that is uh, the description of um, what Avraham is asked to do with Yitzchak, mm -hmm. to, to bring him as an elevation offering. Mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> so with that in mind, let's, uh, what is it, that movie called Back to the Future? <laughs> okay. Let's go back to the future, mm -hmm. right? I want you to place yourself, you know, it's, it's actually very easy to do this today. Mm -hmm. I want you to place yourself in the Second Temple era, mm -hmm. right? And the temple stands. Every day there's ten open miracles that go on. <laughs> the nation is getting ready, ready to gather there for uh, the Pesach service, for the, for the Corbin Pesach, right? And you're there as well, right? And something has gone wrong and you need to bring a Corbin, right? And of course, with trepidation, you enter the Pesach, you purified yourself, you're ready for it. Let's see what he says. To the merely casual student, korbonos represent a collection, korbonos are, are sacrifices, 
a collection of details overwhelming in abundance and short in inspiring understanding. One Corbin stands out as different, the Oas Ha'of, Ha'oif, ha a bird offering, right? Oif is a bird, mm -hmm. a bird offering, offered as a holy burnt offering, makes matters even worse. Its details are not just different from comparable Corbonus, animal Corbonus, mm -hmm. they seem to run in an entirely different direction, the bird offering. Mm -hmm. yeah. The animal Ola requires shkita, the slaughtering, or the neat, clean death of the animal through the use of a perfectly sharp blade. Mm -hmm. Bird offerings require malika, a process of pinching the head with a fingernail in a way that it would render a non-sacrificial bird forbidden in the vela. Right? So let's say you were eating chicken. Mm -hmm. If you killed it the way the coin kills the bird offering, you would not be permitted to eat it. It would be considered not kosher. Mm -hmm. right? Whereas many of the offerings, that, the animal offerings you brought, are this proper shkita. Mm -hmm. Shkita. He's going to explain and, why that is. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm <laughs> This proper shkita, is because there's a lot more questions coming. Yeah. It's kind of proper weird. shkita, and, you, and we eat many of the sacrifices. Those that are not burnt, mm -hmm. usually there's parts that we eat. <clears throat> Bird offerings require malicha, a process of pinching, and they have a sharp nail, thumbnail, mm -hmm. right? And they hold the bird like this and pinch the neck mm -hmm. and break the bird's neck with the, the finger. Mm -hmm. right? uh, the bird offering requires malicha, a process of pinching the head of, with a fingernail in a way that would render a non sacrificial bird nivela, forbidden. On the other hand, malicha can only be done by a coin, a shkita of an offering is kosher even if it's performed by Yisrael. Mm -hmm. right? We think of the coin doing the, the shkita, but in fact, the coin has to uh, spread the blood, deal with the blood. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have to do the sacrifice in the base of English. It can be done by mm -hmm. Yisrael. Yeah. They got a proper mm -hmm. trained person to do it. Anyone who's proper trained can do the shkita, but mm -hmm. not anybody can bring it to the Mizbah, the mm -hmm. blood. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> to go on the physical property of the temple, you had to be a coin, or you could just go even if no. You there were different areas, yeah, yeah, right? There were areas for men, for that. women, yeah. different areas from for Yisrael, Levi, and coin, right? <laughs> and they were divided. But only coins right. could go to the that ramp. The coining went up. To the, they they mm -hmm. were the ones who went up to his back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and they did it with tremendous speed. There was, you know, during the <laughs> uh, Pesach sacrifice, it was watching a tremendously well-coordinated machine because mm -hmm. they would stand together and the blood in which it was gathered into a vessel mm -hmm. that is cone-shaped. Why is it cone-shaped? Because you couldn't put it down. Mm -hmm. right? It comes to a point at the bottom. Mm -hmm. right? Because if you put it down, mm -hmm. right, then the blood could congeal. Oh. Right? So, and the blood had to not congeal, it had to, so they would hand it one to the next, right, as it went up the ramp in order to, mm -hmm. you know, or to the ramp to, to move it very quickly. Because mm -hmm. they were doing hundreds of thousands of animals, mm -hmm. you know, at a time. There are a lot of them. Right? By the way, there are a lot of them. Yeah. The only exception mm -hmm. to this rule, uh, you guys will probably read about it, is right by the, um, I'm not exactly sure of the location, but it's between the Holy and Holies, there was a, a place where, the coin could put down, it was, I think it was a kind of a, a metal circle where you could insert. Like a cradle. Yeah. Uh, where in a very specific situation, but normally it couldn't be done. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's continue. Animal offerings came in many varieties. Uh, uh, bird offerings are restricted to an ola and a chattis. So there's many different kinds of sacrifices you can do, a toda, which is a Thanksgiving sacrifice, shlomim, which is a statement of completion uh, of, of comfort. There's many different kinds that you could do. With a bird, you can only do two, right? Mm -hmm. A chatas and an owa, a bread offering and a sin offering, <clears throat> guilt offering. Animals, animal offerings are brought sometimes for individuals and sometimes for the community. Bird offerings are never brought for the community. Mm -hmm. Animal and bird carbonus are sacrificed as, at different locations within the temple courtyard. The blood of animals is decorously uh, received in a vessel, mm -hmm. right from the shkita, there, and a small amount is either thrown 
uh, or dabbed on the altar with the finger. We, we talk about this during the Yom Kippur service, mm -hmm. right? One of seven, two of seven, right? Okay. Uh, the blood of the bird Ola, ready for this? Is pressed out on the side of the altar, squeezed out of the bird. Parts out of, the of the animal really? are offered atop the altar. The sorry, parts of the animal that are offered on top of the altar are discarded in the case of the bird. The bird's thrown away. Mm -hmm. Even more flagrant is the reversal of procedures regarding the altar. The blood of an animal ola, a burnt offering, is directed below the red line. So let's just take a little look here. Where we can see. Right. You'll see this is uh, one view of the, uh, of the Ms. Bath, and you can see there's a red line down here, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everybody see that, right? The red line down here, right? So some blood was thrown below and some was thrown above. It's much more obvious here, which gives you a better idea of the size of the altar in the second temple, right? And there's the red line again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why was it red? Look. Um, I guess it didn't mean anything. Probably not. <laughs> the O is directed above the red line and separate, that separates the upper and lower regions of the altar. While <clears throat> that of the animal is directed uh, above. The positions flip for birds. The blood of the ola of the burnt offering goes above the line. The blood of the chattas goes below the line. The key to unraveling all the confusion in the <clears throat> is in the understanding that different species symbolize different roles and positions in life. So this is a very, very important thing to understand, and it's the basis of really the whole concept of Corbanus for Jews, which differentiates for sacrifices of the nations. Sacrifices of the nations are simply intended as a bribe to the gods. I give you this, you give me that. I give you my virgin daughter, <laughs> and you give me rain and good crops. Magic. magic. Yeah, it was kind of magic, but they, what they were trying to do was influence God. It was a bribe. Right? Or whatever gods are <clears throat> You know, it worked with the king. Yeah. You know, I give you this, and you make me duke. You know, same yeah, thing. Right? Still it does. Treating God as just more powerful forms of yeah. majesty. Yeah. Yeah, that's all. Our view is very different, and now you, you understand it. And I've mentioned it a few times: is that we are supposed to be have something in common with the all. It's not that we own it, but that we share something in common with it. And on this, Rav Hirsch illuminates it beautifully, and you'll come to understand: what are the offerings? Goat. Sheep, ox, cow, uh, bird. Those are the basic offerings, right? And also meal, right? The different kinds of things. So we're going to talk about some of them today. But as you begin to understand them, you understand how they can apply beyond what we're going to say today. The key to unraveling the confusion is in understanding that different species symbolize different roles and positions in life. The Ola and Chattas themes, elevation and addressing shortcomings, impact different, differently upon different roles, different kinds of people. Bovine offerings symbolize the vigorous servant of God, just as these animals are work animals, right? Cows, oxen, right? An ox pulls the plow. Somebody who brings an ox as a sacrifice, right? is somebody who sees himself as industriously involved in his commitment to Hashem. Right? He is actively involved in doing the work of God. And he identifies with this, this animal, which, although a farm animal, is very much a work animal. <clears throat> Just as the animals work, work are work animals. Sheep don't work. Sheep don't work, right? <laughs> Sheep symbolize trust in divine guidance. Much as flocks are cared for by their shepherds, so it is with sheep. And we describe this, right? Sheep are followers. Sheep rely on the fact that the shepherd will care for them and keep the wolves away, you know. Bulls are quite rough animals, 
You know, they're not animals to trifle with, right? You know, oxen, right? They're, they're, and they're stronger, right? Sheep are, you know, and, you know, we Except cut their fur around. and stuff like that. Those ones are not too nice. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it can be, it can be. But the nature of sheep is that they have a shepherd that guard, yeah. guides them, right? So that's a sheep. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about birds. Birds play a very different and a decidedly undomesticated role. We don't have domesticated birds, per se, <laughs> right? In Tanakh. They're described as unsettled and drifting. They are pursued by hunters who lay in wait for them and leave snares with which to trap them. Their life is troubled and precarious. They represent life on the brink of despair. Some like us. You were getting there. Mm -hmm. It makes perfect sense. Then the bird offerings are attached to the poor who lead precarious lives, and to those overcome with spiritual metzora and with physical zav, with different kinds of afflictions. The community, whose public face does not admit to crushing poverty, never brings a bird offering. Right? <clears throat> That's to say, there are offerings brought, chathas offerings that are brought, by the head of the Beis Din, of, of the, uh, uh, or by a coin gadol, right? Because in their minds they made a misjudgment, right? For this they can they bring it for the community because it affected the whole community. The misjudgment, the the Av Beis Din, the head of Sanhedrin, if he made a mistake and he realizes it, right? It affects the whole nation. The decision he made. So they never bring bird offerings. Mm -hmm. They're bringing oxen sheep. The sense of affliction brought to mind by the bird is also in, incompatible with the role of the shlomim, the, the thanksgiving, the thankful, which, which is supposed to represent undisturbed happiness, completeness. Shlomim is a, a sense of completion of satisfaction. Uh, undisturbed happiness. Also, the requirements of that offering be, be male being a male animal, symbolizing strength and virility, free of blemish, do not attach, and free of blemish. These things do not attach to bird offerings. A bird offering doesn't have to be male, mean, and it doesn't even have to be free of blemish. Right? Check. <laughs> the striking differences in the way bird and animal offerings are treated are consistent with the different roles they symbolize. The shkita of an animal is elegant and refined in comparison to the much more violent pinching of the neck during malicha. The bird's body is then torn asunder rather than neatly butchered. Its very entrails are removed and thrown away. The blood representing the life force is not simply drained, but squeezed out of it. Taken together, the details of the bird offering speak symbolically to a person living with suffering. He or she approaches the south side of the Mizbeach, the side closest to the menorah, and therefore the side of enlightenment, unlike the animal offerings brought in the north, the side of material concerns. The owner of the offering seeks both insight into his condition and elevation from where he is. He presents himself to the coin as a fragile, hapless dove. What he encounters is not visually pretty, but full of meaning for him. He's instructed that enduring oppression can also be a form of serving God. Let me read that again. He's instructed that enduring oppression can also be a form of serving God. Hmm. Indeed, the life that has had all its vitality forcibly pressed out of it also has a place atop the altar. Right? The blood is above the line. Not just the one exhibiting the strength and the willingness symbolized by animal offerings. The oppressed, the suffering, who do not lose sight of their goal of bringing themselves closer to God, also contribute to keeping strong the fires of God's presence. <clears throat> Where some would find only victimhood, the bird offering allows the suffering to find nobility and purpose. Hmm. We can now easily understand the curious inversion of locations on the altar to which the blood is applied and the methods by which it is applied. In an animal korban, the blood of the ola, of the burnt offering, 
is directed below the line, while that of the chattis, the sin offering, is above the line. The ola is conventionally brought by someone feeling a lack of elevation. He, he feels a need of an elevation offering to raise himself from the level he is. He is plagued by a sluggish, lethargic spirituality and wants to be energized. You know, his ola is the, the ola of a, of a sheep or a cow. <clears throat> the animal ola bids him to move energetically. Hence, the blood is thrown, the most energetic form of blood application, urging him to move from where he is upwards with vigor. He finds himself in an unsatisfactorily low state. He needs to rouse himself with alacrity to make this move. The chattas, on the other hand, is the result of some transgression, usually by precipitous, unthinking action without sufficient focus and thought. He made a mistake because he was rushing into something. The blood of the animal chattas directs him to inaction. It is placed with the, with the finger. It's dipped and placed with the finger, not thrown onto the upper part of the altar, urging him to remain in place with whatever spiritual elevation he has achieved. It instructs him not to lose sight of the higher ideals and to stay put rather than run after the desires of the heart. <clears throat> the modus operandi, the system for the suffering personality, is indeed reversed. Whatever spiritual gifts he possessed prior to his troubles, he must keep intact. It is in his inaction, not the energetic action of the ordinary person, that he has his greatest opportunity for utilizing his trait of elevation, for utilizing his traits for elevation, his difficulties for elevation. The blood of the bird oil is not thrown and not even placed with a finger. Rather, it is squeezed and pressed on the upper part of the mizbeach telling its owner that he must summon up his as much energy to keep himself on a higher plane without backsliding. The sins of such a person, on the other hand, are often part of a feeling of despair, which can lead him to discard his values and take up improper activities, feeling that no good will come of his life in any event. We must impress upon him the importance of not acting in such ways of not being swept away in a moment of despair, a moment of weakness. He must pull himself out of the listlessness of his mood by some sort of action. The blood of his offering is sprinkled. Like the throwing of the blood of the animal Ola, the sprinkling of the blood of the bird Chattas implies action, movement, rather than staying put. It directs him to look up away from his passivity, back on track, and forever aiming higher. Something to think about. Mm. You know, the, the sheep. The, when you say the putting, sprinkling the blood, or putting touch, or throwing it, these are the actual physical blood on the wall of that, uh, yeah. of that thing? Right. So, so after the end of the day, it must have an unbelievable amount of blood on it. Yes. Yeah, well, it's very not, secular. Right. Not <laughs> <laughs> and spiritual. Yeah, serious. No, but you know what I mean? Like they'd be to, like, they could be bathing in blood, that thing. Oh, well, first of all, you have to know that this was an issue, right? So one of the great miracles of the Mizbeh of the temple was there was never a fly. It was like the world's greatest slaughterhouse. Yeah. And there were no flies, right? In a warm climate, right? Nothing ever went rancid. Now, you have to know that they didn't take all the blood of a cow and throw it on the back. Not all of it, right? They took a little bit, yeah. right, and they put it on his back. And there was a drain. There were drains that ran underneath the floor, right, into the into the um, a, a underground waterway. What did they do with uh, all the blood? <clears throat> I mean, it ran out in, into the water, and the water ran blood red. Because you have uh, hundred thousand cows, you have an enormous of, amount of blood. No, at the time of the major festivals, the waterway ran blood red. The floors were being washed constantly. There were stone floors, they were being washed constantly. Mm -hmm. You know, they had areas in which the slaughtering was done. They had rings that they put the animals in yeah. in order to slaughter them and take the blood. Things were done very carefully, very meticulously, and everybody had jobs to do to keep everything, you know, But the pristine. walls of the, of the thing, after, let's say, I don't know, a couple of days, they wash it down? I don't know what the process was. I assume that periodically they, they washed it. Would be the wool covered, wiped, washed, and, and maybe mm -hmm. whitewashed it. I'm not sure mm -hmm. how it was maintained, the, the sides and the back. I'd have to read about it. Well, sure. 
But that's the beginning of Vayikra. I think it gives a different perspective to sacrifices, and God willing, we should look forward to the rebuilding of a base of English and to the bringing of sacrifices and the involvement with Hashem and the sacrifices on the level that Rav Hirsch has described it to us. Mm -hmm. And when women gave up their beautiful brass mirrors to be made into the wash basin of right. the Kohen Gadol. Of the Kohenim, all the Kohenim. Kohen, wasn't that a sacrifice too? It's a, this is a, a separate question, right? Uh, and we should actually do, we should have done a whole shear on, on, the, uh, on the waiver. On the, because uh, women were giving up their beauty. Because it was, um, there was a question as whether they were acceptable. Uh, they brought them to Moshe Rabbeinu, and it says that Moshe Rabbeinu didn't want to use them because they were used to make women beautiful to entice their husbands. Right? But Hashem disagreed with that. That's right. Uh, and there are many, um, there are many wondrous and interesting things about the kior. Uh, the what? Kior, the this basin. Oh. You know, one of them is that unlike everything else, you know, when you read about the description of that. Moshe is given on how to build things, right? There's a tremendous amount of detail. How many cubics, how many tfachim, you know, and what's covered with what, what's there. Right? With the kior, there's actually no size. Does it tell you how big to make it? All, all Moshe Rabbeinu is, is told is use the mirrors, right? So if you get 50 mirrors, it'll be a kior the size of 50 mirrors. If you get 600,000, a real big one. Thousand, right? <laughs> he didn't know, right? What was going to happen, right? <clears throat> the women brought it because it was copper and it was to be used for this purpose. You understand that gold that was brought to say build the covering of the the um, uh, of the iron, or to make the uh, um, the menorah, right? Was melted down into ingots. Right and reshaped, whether it was reshaped in the furnace or reshaped by carving tools, it's a separate conversation. But clearly, it was not the same shape that it had come as a donation. Right? Mm -hmm. That wasn't true of the mirrors. The mirrors were not melted down into liquid copper and then reshaped into the kior. Each mirror was somehow, I guess, welded or somehow Morally. connected to the other mirrors Braised. to make up what brazed. Heated up. Yeah, and, uh, I'm not sure what the process is. They didn't melt the whole thing and make a thing. You'd think they would, but instead it was actually a thing made of mirrors. It was made of, of the mirrors. The mirrors were not polished copper that you melted down and then put it into a mold and you had this big bowl. Mm. Each one was put together. One so you have a mishmash or a So there's a great deal to learn about the kior. You know, and the kior had a base that was separate from it. Right, which is significant. There's many things. That, the cure is a wonderful subject, but well, I'm not going to talk about it today. <laughs> and it's because there's so much to cover. One thing that strikes me after reading the Rambam on all the different sacrifices is that the objects of these sacrifices, you can almost constitute a, a new theory of personality. Yeah. And, and, of, and of, of society <clears throat> and, and the individual, of the, purification. Yeah. And this is. You know, this is the point that Rev. Hirsch brings down. I'm sure it, much of it comes from his own to Rambam. Although Rambam is concerned that he thinks one of the reasons there are sacrifices, he mentions, is that we were used to it. We lived in a world of sacrifices, and you don't quickly take people out of their environment. Uh, hmm. So in order that they... That's an interesting point of view. In order they could manage it, because they needed this as a Sacrifice. tool to relate. Right? But clearly the important thing to understand, and it's very, very important to understand, is that carbonus for us are not sacrifices. Carbonus for us are a process of bringing ourselves closer to God, not of, bringing, of getting God to do something for us. It's very different. We don't bring carbonus in order to you know, get better rains. We pray for better rains. We ask God for better rains, right? but we know that God will make that decision. Right? It's not based on, and in fact, there are many times when the prophets say, "You think a korban is a solution? It's not the solution. God despises your korban." Hmm. 
that you could bring a Corbin and behave in such a way? What does he want? He wants you to act justly, walk humbly with your God, love God. Right? So, you know? So, different, uh, so it's a Corbin is not a substitute for proper behavior by any means. It may be a way of helping us to have proper behavior. So one thing that strikes me is that bringing a Corbin, it brings about a separation and then um, leads one down to different kinds of purification. It's very complex. Um, it is very complex. And, the, you know, to, to appreciate it, you need to have an understanding of the whole process, right? Yeah, I still don't really have an you know, understanding of the process. It's, you know, it, it's really a separate shear, and I, mm. I do want to go into basic, except to say that the Corbin was not simply that you brought your cow on a sword and you felt bad. It was a process that the coin didn't have to accept it. They the can coin, say no? The coin said, you brought this, you know, it's not appropriate for you, right? A rich man who brings an inexpensive Corbin, right? may not be doing the right thing, we reject it. What's your state of mind? You know, when you bring the Corbin, you, you know, you started a fire on Shabbos? Why? Why would anyone start a fire on Shabbos? You know that it's, oh, you didn't know it was Shabbos. That's why. You're confused with the days. Well, we have to, you know, make sure this doesn't happen again. It's not just simply I erase the problem. You have to fix the process, right? <clears throat> and there was a relationship between the Kahanan. They were accepting the Korbanas, right? Which was not an easy process to bring. You know, when the, there's complaints in Christianity about how the temple is operated. Really? It seems like tremendously bureaucratic and profitable for the... the, 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 the and there's course. a misunderstanding of it tremendously. You know, when somebody decides they want to commit themselves to become Jewish, Unlike other religions, we don't say, okay, swear an allegiance to our principles of faith and it's done, right? We don't make it easy. No, it's done. Right? We say that it's a process. You have to understand who you are, who we are, to say you want to be part of this family. It's, it's a very complex thing. How much more so when you bring a Corbin? You think you walk up? <laughs> you know, here's my cow, coin, take the cow, you know, and I'm finished, right? You know, you know, I go to the priest, I give him X number of dollars, and I say, forgive me. It doesn't work that way. You go to this guy, and he gives you this ticket, and he sends you to that ticket, and he gives you that ticket, and <clears throat> you're going around in circles, you know, in the process. Did you bring the loaves of bread that go with this, and the wine that went with that? You know, it's it's a whole, you really have to get into it. If you think, you know, we we often see how difficult it is to prepare for Pesach. We're on the doorstep of it, right? It's part of immersing ourselves in Pesach. The process of bringing a Quran is part of it. And if you got to that point where you had everything together and now you come to the coin with all the elements of the thing together and he concludes that there's a lack of sincerity, <laughs> you're right? gone, right? He signals to the Levium. Mm -hmm. right? There's Levium standing on, you know, the Seder is five steps, 15 steps, right? You know, we'll, we'll talk about it in a little while. It's 15 steps, right? All right? And so it was that the separation on which the Kohenim stood, on the Levim stood, were 15 steps. And the coin could signal to the Levim that the person here is not really um, feeling the significance hmm. of what he's doing. And they would change the tone they were singing to evoke through song the proper state of mind in the person bringing the sacrifice. Wow. Right. And only when the Kohen intuited that he had reached this level of sincerity and commitment that he wasn't selling his goat to God. He was his goat. He was his cow working for God. He was his sheep dependent on the, the shepherd. Mm -hmm. Right. It wasn't a bribe to God. It was a recognition of my position with God and an effort to elevate that position, to correct that position, to change that position. Only when the coin concludes that that's the state of mind the person's in, the psychology of it, does the all the preparation that he's gone through have meaning in terms of affecting the, the person and his relationship with God. 
and then the sacrifice is brought. And when he sees the sacrifice shacted, he sees himself shacted. And when he sees it skinned, he sees himself skinned. Mm. Right? And when he sees it burned on the Mizbeah, he sees himself burned. We talk on Pesa on Rosh Hashanah and Kippur about the ashes of Yitzchak Avinu. Mm -hmm. There were no ashes of Yitzchak Avinu. He came down from the mountain. What's it about? Right? On a certain level, there was. On a certain level, there were. Right? He was a Korban, and he lived his life that way as a Korban. Right? The shifting has to be the first part of the separation. But then there has to be another part of the Seder, the ordering, which allows someone to join Hashem and, and actually see the spiritual then. Well, he become you know, the, he becomes, a, the, the sacrifice becomes a gift, as he becomes a gift to Hashem. When, when, when the angel stays the hand of Avraham, he says, don't, you know, don't do this, stop this, right? You know, and don't hurt the boy in any way. He says it twice, right? He's saying it because he knows Abraham is thinking to himself, <laughs> something's gone terribly wrong. My Yitzchak, both myself and Yitzchak, understood that he was the perfect Korban. And now God's not accepting him. He's being rejected. We misunderstand it. We think, ah, Baruch Hashem Yitzchak lived. But at that moment, at that moment, Avraham might very well have perceived it as a rejection of both Yitzchak and himself and his life's work. And it says that he wanted, you know, maybe just a little nick. <laughs> if I can't kill him, maybe I can just give him a little nick, right? So, and, and Yitzchak was into it. When Yitzchak was well, bound... He would have to have been, because he was a man, he could probably have taken him out. That's right. That's right. He was much stronger than, than his father at that age. He yeah. The height of his vigor. Yeah. But he actually said to his father, please make sure you tie everything very tight. Bind me tightly. For fear that I would flinch during the Shkita. Right? And destroy the sacrifice, not being kosher. That was his fear. Right? So... The the idea of that you've described is that there's a point where you're bringing the sacrifice where there's a unity with God. For sure, it's true. That's the whole object of it: is that we're not uh, bribing God; we are trying to come close to God. That's right. You know, that's that's our goal here, right? And through this process of identifying with it, you know, literally going up in smoke at a certain point, you know. Not as in the Vatican, white and black. No. But the Shkita itself. Well, they were trying in their own way. <laughs> <laughs> they got their white So, <clears throat> So, in any case, mm -hmm. um, we're going to be talking a great deal. You know, Vaikra, Leviticus, uh, is a very technical safer, very important safer. I would just point out one tiny little board, which I cannot resist. Mm -hmm. I'm, I have to apologize. If anybody looks at the first word in Vayikra, uh, oh, this is Shmos. Can you hand me? Yeah, great. Okay. So, does anybody know what the word Vayikra means? No. Let's see how they translate it. Okay. Okay. He called to Moshe. He called to Moshe. Right? Vayikar means he called as well. As opposed to Vayikra. Right? Vayikar. Right? But Vayikra has an aleph at the end of it. And if anybody looks in, you'll see it if you look in a Um I will try this here. Okay. You'll see that the aleph is small. It's undersized. See? Mm-hmm. See, the off is undersized. It's a little bit. Why? Right? Because had there been no off there, it would have been the way God addressed, say, Bilam. You know, lots of people. He called to them, right? Vayikra is uh, an affectionate term. Right? Now, we have to understand what's going on, right? 
Moshe has built the tent of meeting. Can't go in. He feels uncomfortable going in because the cloud covered the tent of meeting with glory. Hashem filled the tabernacle. Moshe could not enter the tent of meeting for the cloud rested upon it. The glory of Hashem filled the tabernacle. Right? So he's built it, right? And now he backs away from it. Because at right? the end because of Exodus. There he is. You know, Hashem is there, right? That's the right, very end. Right, very end. Yeah, right, very right. end the beginning of it says, Vayikra, Vayikra. He called to Moshe, and Hashem spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When a man among you brings an offering to Hashem from the animals, from the cattle, or from the flock, you shall bring your offering. He's saying, Come now. Now, come back to me. Right? I'm here. It's, everything's okay. You know. So, it says that when Moshe Rabbeinu was writing the Sefer Torah, God spelled, okay, it said, okay, write Vayikra, Vav, Yud, Kuf, Resh, Alf. Yeah. And Moshe Rabbeinu said, you know, I, I, talking to me affectionately, I think, I'm <laughs> not comfortable with that. Vayikar. You know? you know, when a big Rav describes you as his friend, it can be a discomforting thing because you see him on that level. He may feel that way. He may feel that affection to you, but you still have a level of awe towards him, to his to his Torah, right? And you kind of hesitate. You're flattered by it, but it's not entirely comfortable at that moment, right? When God said, "Write it by Ikra, you know, because I have this affection for you. You're my Moshe. Moshe said, uh, <laughs> "No, I'll. we'll just write Vayikar." God said. I said, Vayikra, Vayikar. I said, Vayikra. <laughs> okay, I'll write Vayikra, I'll write it, I'll write it. But instead of writing it the way it was intended to be, he wrote it with a very diminished olive, right? And a small one. That nobody should think I'm that important, <laughs> that I'm Vayikra. Mm -hmm. Vayikra, Vayikra. And so a little off. Now there's a story told, it's measures told, right? That we talked about this earlier when we read, I showed it to your father, right? There's a translation that when Moshe came down from Harsinai, right, his face glowed so brightly that he would wear a veil when he would talk to the people, right? And it says the rays would come from him, right? The word for rays is Karen, right? Also the word for horn, right? And from this, I think it's Leonardo da Vinci, if I'm right, you know, uh, had the impression, and we've had this endlessly, is that Jews have horns. Mm -hmm. Why we wear black hats, so. right? <laughs> right? Yeah, we don't sell. Yeah. Oh. yeah, we have horns. That's why we wear these hats, you see. It's to keep the horns. Mm. It's amazing how so, people will believe. But, that's a, but it's a translation mm -hmm. from Hebrew, right? Just as it says a rib, we say it, the Hebrew for it is a side of Adam makes Chava, his feminine side is from where Chava was made, right? So it is, he, he glowed and rays shone from him. He didn't have horns, he had <laughs> these rays. So where did the rays come from? Right? It's a great story, this mm. You can imagine that when Hashem said, okay, you know, sit down at the desk and I'm going to dictate the Torah to you, Moshe's a dictate. What? On what? He said, ah, okay. So I have this hide here, you know, and here's a thing of ink and a pen. Start writing. Well, God would tell me he would write it down. Now, God knows mm -hmm. exactly how much ink you need to write the to Torah to the milli, milli drop. He would know exactly how much it is. He knows how long the Torah is going to be. Exactly. He hadn't counted on Moshe making the little off. And this was Moshe's own humility and determination to do it. And so when he got done, when Moshe got done, right, there was still some ink in the bottle because the olive was smaller. It didn't need as much ink to write it, right? You know, and at the end of the day, when he got done, he went like this and, oops. Mm -hmm. right? And it was from that ink of the little off that caused him to glow. 
cause them to go to radiate. And causing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so there's many things in it, but it's a very interesting that it begins with this little off, and it's about the humility. We know that Moshe Rabbeinu is the most humble of men.